Greek mythology, Echo was a mountain nymph, not that Echo. BFD Echo? What's, what's that even mean? Welcome to DP Networking Nibbles, Decoding Packets short form video series. Today's topic, the BFD Echo function. Now the echo function is an enhancement that is available to BFD. It is so popular and useful that on some of the distributions, <coughs> iOS, it is on by default. Other implementations, although, do not seem to care enough about it, even to offer it as a choice. Anyway, we at Decoding Packets, we do not discriminate when it comes to dissipating knowledge of technologies, so we will cover it, if you know the title of the video had not already clued you in. So back to our regularly scheduled programming, the echo function. It enhances BFD in a very specific way. The echo function implementation allows the devices running BFD to test their neighbor's actual forwarding path and the health of that forwarding path. This is something that the control packets are not able to do. How the echo function accomplishes this? Well, let's find out. The echo function at its core uses special echo packets to accomplish its mission. How the echo packets accomplish these goals, it is both clever and it is a bit of a hack. So the trick or the hack lies in the unique way the echo packets are addressed at the network layer or layer three. You see, for the echo packets, the destination network address, or in our IP world, simply the destination IP address, it is actually the IP address of the sender. That's right, let that seep in. The destination IP is the same as the source IP. At the same time though, at layer two or the link layer, the addressing is normal. So the destination MAC is the receiver's MAC address. Most probably that's the MAC they responded to you in their ARP replies. That's obviously different than how a normal packet such as BFD control packet is addressed, right? And just as a refresher, let's reiterate that basic structure. I know you can skip this part if you want to. A control packet, which is a normal packet, it'll have the sender's MAC address as well as the sender's IP address as the sources, while the receiver's MAC address and IP address will be the destinations for both. That is normal. But for an echo packet, the destination IP, as I said before, is the same as the source IP, and both of them belong to the sender. This has huge consequences for the packet when it gets to the eventual receiver. Well, the first eventual receiver. That is the receiver indicated by the MAC address at layer two. Remember that address, the same exact as a normal packet. Now, because of its mundane and rather normal addressing, each control packet will essentially be processed as a to-the-box packet when it gets to the, to the receiver. So as it comes in, it is a to-the-box packet and the receiver absorbs it. As each packet comes in, it is either punted to the CPU or processed by BFD that is implemented at the line card level. But more importantly, like I said, the packet is consumed by the receiver. That packet is now gone. So again, to reiterate the basics, the reason why is simple. When the receiver processes this control packet at layer three, they find an IP address that is owned by them. And thus they know that the packet is meant to be processed locally. And so it is. With the echo packet, this particular behavior at the receiver is where things are radically different. When the receiver processes the packet at layer three, so the echo packet, this one comes in, and the receiver processes at layer three, it finds an IP that does not belong to itself. So the normal routing behavior will now kick in. So the packet, the IP is not yours. You have to route the packet somehow. You are a router. And the packet is forwarded using the forwarding information base. This is what is really meant when we state that the echo packets test the actual forwarding plane because they are initiating that forwarding lookup. And if everything is functioning cor correctly, the packet will then be readdressed at layer 2 with the proper MAC and sent back out the same interface 
where it was received under most normal circumstances. Thus, the packet is essentially looped back to the sender. And once the sender receives the packet, the packet's journey essentially is over. So as long as the sender keeps receiving its own packets back, the forwarding plane on the other end is functional and the BFD session is alive. Remember, the receiver is going to do this on their part as well, but we have only shown one part of the, uh, of the conversation here. So a quick look at the, at the echo packet format. And you'll realize that there isn't much to see here. So even if you look at the packet dumps of it, you'd realize there's not much to see here. The way the RFC describes or defines the packet leaves the contents up to the imagination of the implementer. So they, they basically let you loose. And these are a few excerpts from the RFC for you to read. So one major requirement though, is the sender must be able to recognize its own packets. Well, duh. So as long as the sender places enough unique data inside the echo packet that allows it to identify the packet uniquely, once again, on its return, the implementation has satisfied the RFC requirements. So for example, one major vendor basically is using a 12 byte string per packet. And what it seems they're doing is they pick a base value for each echo uh, function BFD session, say 1000, and then for each subsequent echo packet that is sent out, they increase that number by one. So 1001 for the next echo packet, 1002, and so on and so forth. So as each echo packet comes in, they know where in the sequence it fits in. And if any go missing, then they also know which particular ones were missed. So these properties of the echo packet, the addressing and the content, they also make it uniquely useless for the purpose of exchanging BFD settings. For one thing, these settings are not included because the data in the echo packet is completely arbitrary. But if you think about it, even if the echo packets did carry usable data, they're still useless. Why? Because they're simply looped back. Long story short, the control packets are still needed. They are needed to perform a more restricted function, but they're still needed. Now, where previously they were being used both to carry the BFT information and for the liveliness detection of the session, they now only have the former responsibility. All of the information that, that was exchanged in the echo packets, the intervals, the state, the detection multiplier, those pieces, they're still exchanged by the control packets. In addition, remember, the peers also have to indicate somehow that the echo function is in use. They have to realize that echo function will be used for some parts of BFD now. The control packet is actually used to communicate that as well. The how we will cover shortly. But with the echo mode, the echo packets now take over the responsibility of the liveliness or the forwarding detection. So the control packets, therefore, can be sent far less frequently, which they are. We do send them very, very infrequently. They're sent once every second or once every two seconds versus if you look at just the pure asynchronous mode without the echo function, they were being sent every few milliseconds. Pictorially, what one would expect to see is a control packet goes out, then a few echo packets, go, um, they are exchanged, then another control packet goes out, then once again, there would be a few echo packets that are exchanged, then another control packet goes out, then a few echo packets are exchanged, and so on and so forth. So each one of them is performing a very specific task the control packets to exchange the BFD information, whereas the echo packets, they will detect the communication loss if it occurs or regular communication if that is happening right now. As mentioned in the last slide, there is also a need to somehow signal that the peer is interested in using the echo function. The control packet is used to indicate this as well, and uh, all in addition to all of the other BFT variables. So specifically, the last field of the control packet, the required min, echo, rx interval, it is leveraged for this purpose. In fact, it only exists for this purpose. So very simply, if the echo function is in use or it is desired, this field will reflect a finite value in milliseconds. If not, if you don't want to use the echo function, the value is simply zero. So if it's zero, 
the neighbor is not interested in using the echo function. But more importantly, what does that finite value, those milliseconds, what do they represent? As you might have guessed by the name, it dictates to the peer that is receiving the packet that if the echo function is used, how frequently can the sender receive echo packets? Right, so it is basically, it's the same thing as the desire min rx interval, but for echo. So in essence, the frequency of a peer's echo packet Packets are dictated, it's once again dictated only partially by its neighbors. In that you cannot send packets more frequently than this advertised value. So if you receive a packet that has a required min echo rx value, and you are also configured to use the echo function, you can only send as fast as this particular value. So I can send it at a lower frequency, I can send it further apart, but not higher. I cannot send them any faster than whatever that particular millisecond value is. But this is not much different than the way um, we perform BFD detection in uh, non-echo mode. Finally, two major caveats when it comes to using the echo function. Although when, you, when one thinks about it, they are both pretty sensible. So number one, disable ICMP redirects. On any interface where the echo function will be used, disable the ICMP redirects. The reason, it's pretty simple. Since the packet is looped back out of the same IP interface, by default, the router will be forced to generate an ICMP redirect message, and it'll generate one for each such packet. So this behavior is undesirable and it should be turned off if you're interested in using the echo mode. Number two, any unicast reverse path forwarding checks, URPF checks, they will also break the echo function because the echo packets, they will simply fail the URPF checks depending on how strict those checks are. This again has to do with receiving an unexpected packet from the view of the URPF, which is basically just looking at the routing table. So you're receiving unexpected packets on unexpected interfaces. URPF freaks out and drops the packet. So either the URPF checks have to be ceased on that interface, or you can simply carve an exception for the echo packets. But those are the two caveats that you should be aware of. Well, that happens to be all for this time, folks. But in our next Network Nibble, we'll close out the topic of BFD with some live demos. Till then, I hope you've enjoyed this video and are looking forward to the next one. Thanks.